Oh, I'm frozen. Good afternoon and a welcome to the Alice Moreau Festival of the Short Story, where we celebrate short stories and Canadian writers in the landscape that inspired Alice Munro. We apologize for the short technical uh, glitch that we had there, but it seems to be working now and we will continue with our program. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land where we are coming from today is the traditional ter territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee and neutral peoples. We recognize the First Peoples' continued stewardship of the land and the water, and that this territory was subject to the dish with one spoon wampum, under which multiple nations agreed to care for the land and resources by the Great Lakes in peace. We would also like to acknowledge and recognize the Upper Canada Treaties signed in regards to this land, which include Treaty Number 29, Treaty 45 and a half, and our roles as treaty people, committed to moving forward to the, in the spirit of re reconciliation, gratitude, and respect with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. And our thoughts remain with those people that have been affected by the horrible news this week. I'd like to move into our conversation today and welcome our author, Lindy Macheski. Lindy is a former academic journal editor turned writer. She is the author of Ontario Picnics, A Century of Dining Outdoors, a two-time Taste of Canada Gold Award winner for old, Out of Old Ontario Kitchens and Sir John's Table. She is the food columnist for the Kingston Whig Standard, which is Canada's oldest newspaper. Her work has appeared in a wide variety of anthologies, magazines, and literary journals. Lindy spent her early years in England, but makes, now makes her home in the beautiful historic Kingston, Ontario, where you can find her most days walking her big shaggy dog along the shore of Lake, the St. Lawrence River. And Lindy's love affair with food and history began when she was three years old, rolling out the pastry for jam tarts in her grandfather's ancient Yorkshire kitchen. Welcome, Lindy. Thank you so much, Nancy. I was listening to Mary Lawson's session before, and... I, I know that we have the reverse trajectory. I started in England and came to Canada. Um, but, you know, it's interesting how those early, those early days influence us so much. They do. And my father was a Yorkshireman. So I, and, <laughs> and jam tarts are my favorite. So, you know, we're all on the same page here. <laughs> it's wonderful. So I'd like to ta start talking to you um, about your book. And I'm going to give you an opportunity. You have a little introduction that you're going to read first. And then um, we'll dive right into some talk about picnics. Perfect. Oh, sorry. Yep, go ahead and read your introduction. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm cluing in. Actually, and before I start, I wonder if I can just interject madly sure. here and say that um, like I'm so thrilled and honored to be here. And I actually hauled all my Alice Monroe books off the shelf. I'm going to hold them up. Um, she means so much to me, but I have this massive stack of, Wonderful. of Alice Monroe books. And Wonderful. I actually, this will, this will definitely uh, date me, but I, um, I did grade 13, so that's quite some time ago, and we read uh, in my grade 13 I, class, the girls winner. Yep. Who Do You Think oh, who You, do you are? Think Are, yes. And I, it is just, remains one of my all-time favorite books. I think that's the same edition I read, so we're, you know, of an age. <laughs> yeah, it's almost, I don't know if you've opened it lately, but the print is so that's tiny bad. Yeah. that it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I will launch into my reading, and I want to start with the epigraph because I just love this, and I found this so inspirational. Um, this is from Rebecca Rupp, and it was in it's from an article called "Eat, Drink, and Be Merry," uh, and from National Geographic in 2014. 
There's a good argument that many of the characteristics that define us as human do evolve from our peculiar custom of sitting down together for a meal. Among these are kinship systems, spoken language, technology, and a sense of right and wrong, all of which have their roots in food, brought home and divvied up among people gathered together around a primitive communal hearth. Researchers guess that we and our distant ancestors have been sharing meals in this way for nearly two million years. And I, I think for me, this is really like about the fundamentality of food and how important it is, which is sort of where I start. I've started all of my most recent projects, um, remembering how important food is and also honoring generations of women that have primarily been the, the um, deliverers of food to the table. So this is the introduction, and it's called The Long History of Picnic and Condensed. A basket, a blanket, a baguette, a wedge of cheese, and a bottle of wine, picnics transport us. They take us on a journey through time and memory and place. Say the word picnic, and we all have an idea in our heads, a memory, a collective, almost universal vision of picnics past, of family and friends, of happiness and food, and of time spent outdoors. The history of picnics is essentially the history of humankind. We began by eating outside. We have, in a sense, been picnicking forever. Indigenous peoples the world over have long kept this tradition, viewing eating outdoors as an important way to connect to both the earth and the spirit world. For over 55 million years, humankind and our earliest primate ancestors roamed the earth in search of one thing, food. When Homo sapiens first appeared between 200,000 to 300,000 years ago, our quest for food continued to rule everything about our lives. It still does. We are hardwired to think of our next meal and the need is encoded in our DNA. Food is paramount for survival. As humans evolved, so did our ideas about eating collectively, sharing food and eating with family and community. We eat because food is life, but food is also about hunger and yearning, about memory and love, about life and death, about the land we live on, about community and belonging and the powerful connections between us. It's only relatively recently on the human ev evolutionary timeline when we ceased being full-time nomads and hunter-gatherers and turned towards agriculture that we began to settle, build homes, and move indoors. And it was only after this that the notion of eating outdoors became seen as a treat, a special occasion, a cause for celebration. Later still came the name itself, Picnic. We remember picnics. They capture our imagination and stick with us. There is something extraordinary, beautiful, happy, and even deeply therapeutic about picnics. Perhaps it is because, perhaps it is the bringing together of community, of eating together. Uh, perhaps it is because of the impact of the places we choose to picnic, often immersed in nature and natural beauty. Or maybe it is a simple matter of time spent outdoors, something that is increasingly rare as our lives move further and further indoors. And then finally, there is the food itself. From the simplest meal to the most extravagant, we are hardwired to remember food. Our food memories so deeply are so deeply embedded in our psyche, they're often our first and last memories of life. Evolution plays a role here, ensuring that the hippocampus is primed to form memories about the things that are essential for survival. But it may well be that our recollection of picnics is even more profound because it is linked to some deeply embedded collective primordial memory of that early human experience of being nomads and hunter-gatherers of eating outdoors. Picnicking is a return to who we are and where we came from. And it goes on, but I think I'll leave it at that because that's the general gist of it. And maybe we can move into questions Absolutely. and pictures and some of those other things that we want to cover. Perfect. And thank you so much for, for your, part of your introduction. It's, it's just a fascinating book that when... Um, I first, you know, you first look at it, and you think, oh, it's a book of pictures, it's kind of nice. And then as I delved into the pictures, I could see the story evolve and how, much like you say in your introduction, how basic and necessary and, and um, unifying food is. Uh, you know, people a thousand years ago ate food, we eat food, it's, it's something that we can draw through the line of history, and I think it's it's really amazing to to do that walk um, in through this book. So I just want to remember remind the audience members that um, are here through Eventbrite that you can uh, put some questions into chat, and I will try and catch those as they come up. If you have questions for Lindy, um, please just type them into the chat, and we'll we'll work through that. 
So some of the things that highlighted for me, Lindy, right away in the early part of the book and the early pictures, and we'll maybe start with some of the, the, um, some of the first couple of pictures that we have that we can put up on the, the screen, um, is there it is, the, the hats. Oh my goodness, the hats and the, um, the dress. Now, what it, it, it reminded me was that the, um, the dress was very formal then, that the event of a picnic, we now see it perhaps as, as something that's casual and laid back and outside, whereas for them it was very much an event and somewhere to wear your very best hat. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think that all sort of public events, picnics were, were generally public events, um, you know, people dressed up for. It was uh, definitely, I mean, there's there's these pictures of picnics where there's two and three hundred people at the picnics. And apparently the work that went on for these picnics when, you know, was 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 months of work because uh, especially in the late 1800s, but even into the early 1900s, when you know church groups for example would put on picnics they would be working on them for three four months beforehand and there would be at least two weeks of food preparation alone but the organizing of the horses and wagons to bring people to the picnic sites and the, you know so the transportation and the logis logistics were quite complicated yes. but yes they were very big you know they were they were huge community events they brought entire communities out and i i think you know we've we've really lost that but there was very little else that they could do. They didn't holiday. The uh, picnics were summer holidays. And actually, I don't know if we can slow the photos down or maybe even go back to sure. the first one if that possible. Yep. But I, um, so this one here is uh, in Prince Edward County. I think it's um, Bay of Quinty um, that we're looking at. And these, this, these, this picture is part of a whole series of photographs by a guy called Her Harold. Mercuric Rathbun, and I just want to tell this little story. So he, he's um, sort of late 1800s, early 1900s, his photographs, and all of his photographs, all of his uh, negatives actually were found in a dumpster. Somebody had thrown them out. Wow. And they were freed from a dumpster, and then they got sent to a local archives where they were restored, and they're one of the most magnificent collection of photographs um, that we have, and they're they're all scattered throughout East Ontario, but he was an incredibly talented photographer because this is early. This is uh, 1909, so early days of, of still um, most photographs were by professional photographers, but he clearly had an eye for what he was doing. I just love this photo because not only the hats and the and the you know the beautiful white blouses and the long skirts, but also they've got their teapot and they've got china teacups and they've got it like it looks like a glass jar for their milk or their sugar. I mean, it's just the details that pheno just phenomenal. Agreed, and that's something I, I'd like to to discuss next. We can maybe go to the uh, third photo if you can, guys. Um, that uh, the china and. And the idea of bringing uh, the outdoors, or sorry, the indoors outdoors. So often in these photos, you not only see that they have their very best china tea, teapot and their china teacups, um, but there might be a lace tablecloth. There might be what looks to be the dining room table and chairs that have been uh, put out on the lawn. Um, it's so interesting, isn't it? They just yeah. and the pillows, you know, the accoutrement is just fantastic. Well, so, and also, this is another interesting. The early photographers were quite interesting. This was taken by uh, Marsden Camp, and he started his life as a pianist, trained to be a concert pianist, and apparently was incredibly talented. But he had some sort of an accident. I don't know what that was. So he retrained to be a piano tuner. But I think it was so disheartening for him that he gave it up and he took to cycling all of Eastern Ontario. So he lived in various places throughout Eastern Ontario, in Kingston, um, but also in Prince Edward County. And he bicycled the entire, okay, he also used a canoe to take, to take photographs, but he bicycled throughout Eastern Ontario taking these wonderful photographs. And again, they were left in a lump somewhere. And so we have no dates, they weren't identified. So all of his photos have the, you know, the line 1898 to 1920. And, to me, looking at this photo, this has to be this has to be closer to 1920. The, the clothing that the women are wearing, with the blazer on the woman up front. Yeah, it's almost Edwardian. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, this so. is so interesting. The details that are, you know, the 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 porches and the verandas and the uh, all of the. And this table is quite curious because it actually looks like a folding table. I so wondered if it been, was. Yeah, it could have been a picnic table. 
Yeah, the, the early picnic tables were maybe uh, perhaps handmade mm -hmm. folding tables. Uh, it'd be uh, mm -hmm. fantastic to um, trace some of those houses down to see how much of the detail and the, the trim and the architecture is still there. Um, mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about your research um, and how you found these photos and, and the journey that that took you on. Oh, so unlike Mary Lawson, I feel like all I want to do is research. <laughs> I just find, and I go down a lot of rabbit holes with all of it, but I... Um, when I started this book, I basically, uh, and, and it was the same, basic same technique when I, when I wrote Out of Old Ontario Kitchens, I, I had a map of the province and I sort of identified the regions and tried to cover as many of the regions as I possibly could because, I, I, you know, I, that's sort of important, and it's, especially since we're talking about a limited geographic area, we're talking about Ontario. So I, I, um, I then set out on a road trip and <laughs> landed on old friends and stayed with them and in various places and stayed in some funny little Airbnbs here and there and everywhere and went to a number of old, like, you know, small town archives and small town museums. And often in those archives, the pictures are not, you know, they're not, they haven't been cataloged yet. So looking for a picnic picture was like looking for a needle in a haystack, but I would sit with the archivist and we would go through stacks and stacks. And, and it was just so much fun finding the images. Mm -hmm. So that was one way. I also did, of course, shouts out on social media saying if anybody has family photographs um, of picnics that I'd love to see them. And we just sort of, you know, I made this big list, master list and, and covered the province as best I could and sort of covered a lot of topics too. Um, I wanted to make sure that you know, Mennonites were represented and Indigenous uh, First Nations people were represented, Indigenous populations were represented, and, and also the waves of migration. So uh, I, I did my best to cover those. And, you know, I had, it's we don't, I don't think we're looking at that picture today, but there's a 1941 Emancipation Day picture from Port Dalhousie in the book. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I hunted and hunted and hunted for Emancipation Day picnic. I was in Owen Sound going through the, the museums, the libraries, the archives. Uh, I was staggered that there were no pictures. Just, yeah. they were, you know, Speaking to it's the, just such a gap yeah, in our history. Those communities that were perhaps uh, more impoverished and didn't have the access to professional photographers that would come out and, exactly. and uh, take pictures of important landmark times and events yeah Why? and you know for me that was a really like it I, it kind of gave me goosebumps that we have you know we have this void in our history that it's so sad really but I did find a picture and it's a picture that I absolutely love and um the person whose picture it, collection it belongs to is Wilma um Miller Morrison and she's in Port Dalhousie or St. Catharines and they were able to track her down and ask for permission to, uh, for the for the photograph but this is all sort of part of the process and and to me this, those are the really big stories and the stories kind of behind the images and even the images you can't find. So did you have a lot of luck with families that had uh, photographs or did you find most of them through archives? I, I would say most of the like probably about 20% of the pictures in the book are family photographs. And they were primarily photographs that had a story to them. Um, and there's some really poignant stories. Like there's a picture in here um, of a picnic during World War I on Toronto Island. And it's a, a, a mother and children picnic on the island. The men are all away at war, presumably. But I know, we know for sure that the person who sent me the picture um, was killed in the war so and and his wife in toronto had six children so she isn't in the picture her two sons are and then one of those sons goes on to be killed in the spanish civil war so you know i just found these stories so uh like you know a heartwarming but and tear-jerking and real and vivid and i just to, to have the picture that went along with the story was kind of an incredible thing but to me the stories mattered as much as the pictures I know yeah. I didn't ask you a question because you asked me about <laughs> the, the, the cover photo is a family photo. Like it's, right. it's from a family collection. And that's um, Peter Amos uh, sent me that picture and it was taken by his father and it's on um, Lighthouse Beach just outside of North Bay. And he was a amateur photographer, but absolutely spectacular amateur photographer. Just wonderful. I think this picture on the cover is 1937 by memory. Yeah, somebody who could uh, date cars could probably tell us uh, that even better because yeah. uh, it's definitely there. <laughs> well, that's um, one of the clues. <laughs> there's so, yeah, there are little, it's, it's almost being a detective to, to find the little clues of, oh, well, that, that style of 
dress or that age of car, um, it must help to date it. So many of the pictures in the book are about around events, either the you know, historic of, you know, time events, Emancipation Day, um, but also a, a barn raising. I loved the, unfortunately we don't picture, or uh, wanted to show you of that, but of the barn raising and the tr very traditional picture I think that we've seen of uh, all the, the men up on the structure, um, yeah. hanging out, sitting up way higher than I could ever could ever sit in, up in the air. Yeah, and it's then terrifying. I assume it's the one that it's dated the same. So I'm assuming it's this, it's the same day. Um, a picture yeah. of a long table, very long table of men. And again, yeah. even though they're all obviously they're building a barn in a day, um, there's the tablecloth, there's the napkins, there's the teapot, there's the china, there's the real bowls, knives and forks. Um, it's it it kind of contrasts what you might see today. I think of. Uh, what would happen? <laughs> you, you wouldn't have the China necessarily. You wouldn't have a barn raising, and if you did, yeah, you might not have a barn raising either. So I also strapped to the rafters, right? There's no harnesses. It's just incredible. Those men standing along the top rafter. I mean, those barns are huge, right? Yeah. It's absolutely huge. Yeah. And I, yeah, so I found the barn raising dinners quite amazing, and I and there's quite a lot of information about them. So there would be again two weeks of food preparation, making pickles, and you know all the things mm -hmm. that can be made in advance are made in advance: the sausages and you know starting crocs. And then of course, as they get to the end, it's all the things that have to be fresh: the bread, the pies, the buns. So all of the men are, and and a lot of the children are involved in the barn raising, and all of the women are doing the food. The food. So right. this huge crowd, just a huge, you know, be 200 people at a barn raising. Yeah, and they, they got it done. Um, <laughs> I, I was also fascinated by some of the, and I thought they were fairly ingenious ideas that I might try and use. There was one picture where there's a long table, and at one end of the table is a chair, and at the other end of the table is a chair. And in between, there's a plank set across those two uh, chairs, and, you know, six or seven people are... are um, sitting along the edge of the table. So I thought, oh, well, that was quite ingenious. Before the, the standard, uh, what we recognize as the picnic table of today, they, they used two chairs and a plank and sat more people than the two chairs would hold. Um, I yeah. want to move on to talking about, of course, the food. And we actually have uh, a question from the audience. Um, Marion asks, um, she says, well, she has a comment first. She says, my favorite cookbook is a 1955 edition of From Saskatchewan Homemakers Kitchens and where all the recipes are handwritten by the women who submitted them. Uh, it includes my grandmother's recipe for my favorite, Saskatoon berry pie. So she would like to ask Lindy, what did, do you have a favorite recipe and do you have a favorite cookbook? Oh my, I have about a thousand cookbooks um, and <laughs> they're all my favorites, I think. But. I mean, that's really cheating. I, I use them all for different things. Um, a lot of them are historical, but I do really love the community cookbooks, the, the sort of, you know, mm -hmm. where recipes were sent in by contributors. I love those books. And my favorite, absolute favorite recipe for a picnic and, and what I would take on a late summer picnic is an elderberry pie. Um, mm. I didn't know what elderberries were until I wrote Out of Old Ontario Kitchens. And I discovered that the plant that I thought was giant hogwart and had been avoiding was actually an elderberry bush. And I collected the elderberries. I obviously plant id it properly. And then I uh, collected the elderberries and made this pie. And I had never tasted anything like it. It's just the best I agree. pie. But, I mean, I love, I love fruit pies. And as for what I take on a picnic, it's so varied. Um, pizza and Prosecco, a muffalata sandwich, uh, my grandfather's sausage rolls, all of the, like, but you know, I think there's no, I don't think it has to be fancy. I, I, oh. I took a friend on a picnic last summer and we had a loaf of bread, a wedge of brie, some raw honey and a small bottle of Prosecco each. And I just, it was a beautiful picnic. So I, I think keep it simple and, um, Absolutely. But yeah, I want to try a Saskatoon berry pie desperately. I've got a Saskatoon berry tree at the property that I'm at. I'm just trying to uh, stave the gypsy moths off it right now. Yes, that is an issue this year. And, and I agree about the elderberry. When I grew up, our next door neighbors had an elderberry bush. Now, my mother never cooked with them, but um, I, I do have remembrances of elderberry pie at the next door neighbors. So it's something that's on my list to, uh, to try. Um, Mind, yeah. 
we had asked, or we had sent out some uh, recipes uh, via Facebook, and uh, we'd love to know if any of the audience got a chance to try some of those recipes. And, and are you uh, enjoying this uh, interview with Lindy while you're eating a picnic, perhaps at home? Um, so do let us know in the comments if, uh, if you're doing that. I want to just give a shout out to uh, one of your other books here that you just mentioned, Out of Old Ontario Kitchens. You can tell that um, I like it because I've got post-it marks in there. Um, great book and some of the recipes in there are absolutely picnic worthy. The elderberry pie recipes in there. And thank you for that. Man. Yeah, it's, um, that's, that was a great question. Thank you. Uh, I Marianne. think it was Maureen that I, oh, okay. Thank you so much, Marion. Yeah. Great. So in some of the photos in, uh, the picnic book that we're talking about today, um, I was trying to, to zoom in with my eyes and, and see what was on the table. Um, did you get a sense of uh, people taking, I mean, nowadays we take these pictures that are, um, you know, you go to a restaurant and you have to you know, stop and Instagram your food before you uh, consume it. Did you get any idea that, that they took pictures of the food or was that secondary to the people? I, I really do think the, f the food was really fundamentally important, but they, they hadn't, you know, food photography was not a thing. So I think this has come much later. Um, but, you know, having said that, I'm still open. I have my book open at page 39, which is the barn raising dinner. And that's a spectacular uh, photograph of the food, actually, of the cut mm -hmm. glass they have on this table. Yeah. And the, you know, um, so I, I think it was very secondary. I think they, they didn't, you know, they weren't focused at all on on taking pictures of the food. I think the idea of picnics was primarily about community. Certainly feeding people, it was necessary. But um, it was just one of those tasks. Um, perhaps we can put up the picture from page 50, which is a, is a favorite of mine because uh, it's the ladies from the Eaton Company mail order office. And I believe this would have been um, like a, a work picnic. Uh, and Absolutely. clearly they were having some kind of beverage. I'm not sure what <laughs> beverage that would be, but there, isn't there one in every crowd that, that has to uh, you know, hoist the bottle in, in the photo? <laughs> It looks like they've got some champagne, I think. I don't know what the, the, the bottle that the woman in the crowd has, but yeah, she's quite delightful. So this was 1910, and um, I, 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 this is Toronto, and this was women from the mail order catalog. So they would have been sort of behind the scenes, and this was their annual picnic. It looks like this is probably the whole, you know, the whole office had come out for this picnic. I mean, it really, I could, for, for all these pictures, I tried to write a, insert a little bit of history. And I mean, it's just a kind of an incredible thing that Eaton started in the 1800s. It was, um, let me just see here. Uh, oh, yeah. So in 1869, Eaton started in Toronto. And in 1999, they went bankrupt. And I think that's a, you know, it's a phenomenal story all by itself, the, the story of the tea Eaton company and, and, the, and the Eaton family. So, yeah, but, this, uh, yeah this, this photograph, I mean, clearly, it's, it's great. I mean, you just, you met a woman's office party in 1909. They're having a picnic. Yeah, and, and <laughs> um, from a, a woman's point of view, it's, it's quite uh, fascinating that working women were in the minority in those days. So uh, interesting that we got a, a documentation of working women mm -hmm. for their, uh, having their annual picnic. Um, mm -hmm. Somewhere in the middle of the book, uh, I noticed a big difference, uh, and we can maybe go to the picture on, on page 74, we'll, we'll illustrate it quite nicely, um, that all of a sudden the car becomes prominent in, in the pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, up until uh, this point, there were some, um, lots of different modes of excursion. There was you know, some horses and cart, and obviously people um, you know, walked or, or picnicked local to home. But this one uh, depicts the Ford Motor Company's first annual uh, company picnic in, very, very close to our location here, Grand Bend, Ontario. Um, what do you think the, the motor car did uh, to the picnic to, to change it? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, for, you know, I mean, there's, a lot, there's an awful lot of uh, photographs as we move on from 1920. So cars cars start appearing in Ontario in the early 1900s, 1904, 1905. Um, and as we progress through the decades that follow, people are obviously far more mobile. So you you know there are, there are, I found a lot of 
and, and, and simultaneously, we're also moving away from professional photographers and to to uh, almost fully amateur pho photo photographs that we come across in, in places. And the quality of the photos definitely changes. So there's way more of them. The quality isn't necessarily as high. This one was probably a, a professional photograph still. Um, but the, the, the car changes everything because it makes everybody mobile. People are, you know, going to Algonquin Park. People are going to, into Northern Ontario to places they've never been and exploring. And you see picnics everywhere. Um, and the cars are often photographed because they were a real point of pride. So this, you know, the, the photographer would have come out here and, and obviously taken pictures of the crowd, but clearly he stopped to take this fantastic picture of these cars in the, in I was, the lot. Wait, yeah, I'm I was just, thinking, I, it, it's just a gem. And I was thinking that in 19, uh, what are we, 1920, um, the drive from Windsor, Ontario to Grand Bend would, would have taken quite a time in, in those Model T's, one presumes that they're Model T style Fords. Again, I'm not a car person, but um, the, the picture on page uh, 82 as well shows um, uh, the picnic with the car as uh, part of the seating. But I think yeah, well, what we've seen here is uh, a bit of a progression from the ladies with the great big hats and the fancy clothes to these women are slightly more casual. Um, that we still have the uh, China, we still have a tablecloth, we have maybe a little folding table um, and the, the lovely basket. Uh, but things are easing into uh, driving out to where the cherry blossoms are and setting up a little impromptu family picnic. Yeah, I just love this. I love the, there's a, the woman sitting on the running board. Um, you know, it just these. There, there's another. There's a. There's, this is a series of photographs that were taken um, amongst the cherry blossoms in Grimsby, and there are. There's a couple of other pictures where you see the whole lineup of the cars and all the people sitting on the running boards. It's quite delightful, but I liked this one because we can see the we can see the picnic and we see, we see the women so clearly here. This was a Boyd photograph, and both John Boyd Senior and John Boyd Junior were. Um, professional photographers. So I don't know who's in the picture, but I think this was probably taken by John Boyd Sr. I think that might be John Boyd Jr. that's here. They were um, Globe and Mail photographers and uh, renowned. This And this photo is just so crystal clear and so beautiful. Susan has a question uh, for us from the audience. Uh, do you write about church picnics, garden parties? And those, she says, are some of her fun memories. <laughs> yeah, there are both church picnics and uh, garden parties in the book. And those church picnics, those early church picnics, they were really such a big deal. So the I, would, I talked earlier about a little bit about the preparation for them, but almost always a newspaper was invited and involved and would in, in the early days, so late 1800s and early 1900s, and would be taking photographs. So we do have a pretty good record of those picnics as opposed to some of the other things which we're lacking a record for. Again, yeah, the, the local newspapers would um, document uh, happenings around the, the community and a big picnic, a family picnic, a church picnic, a work picnic, um, would be news and uh, need to be documented. So that's uh, no doubt, invaluable way to find some of those old photos. Uh, Donna Walton uh, has asked, uh, eating outdoors is very popular now with the pandemic as families and friends are meeting outdoors safely uh, over picnics. Have you found an increased interest in your book because of this? You know, I haven't heard anything about what's happening with the book, so I, I, I won't answer that. But um, we, I was scheduled to publish this book a year earlier, and uh, it was going to the printers last, it was due to go to the printers last April uh, and be out last May, but um, it, was such, it was such early days in the pandemic that my publisher didn't know what was going to happen and didn't know if book distribution would continue or, you know, things would go on. And as it happened, the pandemic has actually... Uh, not been terribly detrimental to books. Um, but uh, and I don't think I'm answering the question here. Well, the question, um, sorry. She was just asking if, if she had asked the question about it, was there an increased interest. But also, I, I think there is an inter interest in picnics now. I think there is an increased pic uh, interest in picnics, which is fantastic. I, I'm really happy about it because I think it's, it's you know, such a... Uh, 
for me, exploring, going around the province and looking at these pictures really uh, renewed my love affair with Ontario. And I think I'd lost that. I think that we spend so much time indoors and we spend so much time on highways and we're so far removed from many of us from the natural world. Uh, so for me, just even like traveling around to the small towns, but seeing these beautiful pictures of lakefronts before an era of cottages, um, you know, and, and recognizing that we have one fifth of the world's freshwater supply in Ontario. Just to me, the, the kind of recognition of how vast and magnificent the province is and how charming it is. Uh, that was the kind of happiest outcome of the book for me. And if that's a, an outcome for anybody else that looks at it, that will make me very, you know, that'll, that will please me <laughs> immensely because I just, I feel like we need that. We need this move back to, to nature and we need this move back to the, to, to being outdoors and enjoying the outdoors and celebrating it, celebrating where we live and finding yeah. it charming again. Yes, I agree. On page 91, we'll maybe move on to that picture. Um, this is a little earlier than my childhood, but it reminds me much of uh, going on field trips with my family as a young as a young girl. And um, prior to the advent of fast food and um, roadside uh, stops, where there's you know three major um, fast food uh, locations and gas, um, th th those places didn't exist. So you did pack your own lunch and you stopped on the side of the road. You found a nice flat spot or not flat spot, and um, laid out the blanket and had and had your meal. Yeah, I think there is a return to that. And so we, we I didn't fully answer the question before, but I I noticed uh, I saw a news story about how the parks, the Ontario parks, um, are offering um, day passes during the week for people to go and use the and they're free day passes. Um, just throughout the rest of the pandemic and I saw today that they're going to have to change the rules because they're so inundated so yes people are returning and of course they're they're you know of course they're picnicking because if, when you go to you know one of your your provincial parks for the day that's what you do is you pack up a picnic and um so yeah um just to return to that but this this uh, Ancaster um picnic is in the book uh, for kind of personal reasons for me, because I, when my family moved from England, we lived in Ancaster. And I didn't realize until I was writing the book that it's the second oldest settlement in, beside, Kingston is first, but it's the second oldest settlement in Ontario. So, um, but I just, I, you know, my, I went to high school there and, and read Alice Munro there. <laughs> awesome. Um, it actually reminded me of those drives that I would do with uh, my family and my mother was from Hamilton. So um, we would drive in that direction and somewhere along the, the line, it, it must have been maybe on the Hamilton Escarpment or somewhere like that. But there was a spot um, where my dad would stop and there was quite literally a pipe coming out of the, the side of the cliff beside the, the road with water. And it was a treat to stop there and have your little glass or mug or whatever you had and, and fill it up and or bend your head and, and do it and drink directly out of the side of the, the road. <laughs> I'm not sure that well, people would do that today. Yeah, I drank from that, that very place. So I, it, it, mineral, it's, a, it's a mineral spring of it some must sort. Be, yeah, I, I have just a sketchy memory of it. I think it's off Sulphur Springs Road in Ancaster. Okay. <laughs> that, that could be it. That could be it. I'll have to go and see if we can, we can still find, find it. Again. it. Yeah. Um, so when we move on a little bit into uh, page 121, what we saw there, I thought, uh, to me, uh, reminded me more of my childhood and the, the change uh, on the table of the uh, food items. So now you don't necessarily see the big loaves of homemade bread or um, the homemade pies, but I see a ketchup bottle and um, possibly what looks like it might be coffee mate or something like that. It is. Uh, it and is. and uh, this, this is 1972, so this is definitely my generation. Um, and the women are dressed casually um, in some of the other pictures uh, close to this uh, time frame. Uh, there's women in shorts or pants, and, and uh, it's not the same as the, the earlier pictures with the, the long dresses and the big flouncy hats. <laughs> yeah, we've moved into a, a whole new time zone. Yes, yeah, so this picture I absolutely love. And, um, you know, I, 
I just find this, first of all, the clothes are fantastic. The caftan here and the cat's eye glasses. Yeah. But yeah, the food on the table. I mean, I, I actually poured or I enlarged this and poured over. It is coffee made. There's a jar, there's a jar of sugar up front. Yes. Um, and there's, there's a, there's a sort of a no name cola, you know, they've got their, they've got their, and they, but they've got their coffee mugs. Like they've got their real coffee mugs and their plates and things. And it's just, yeah, it's a classic picnic. They're probably having hot dogs or something. Yes. Um, and maybe they've got a, a a barbecue off to the side but I just I think this is a beauty of a photo and obviously you can see we, you know the, car, the change in the cars I just I find the kind of evolution of history so interesting you can sort of see it through the photos and um yeah, you know, see how the province that's changed. the delightful thing about the way you have this book laid out because it does go chronologically from uh the very early uh late 1800s and um up into I think your your latest is somewhere in the the 70s um, oh, actually, it was a, I oh, ended it in the end. I ended with a picture in, uh, of um, it's 2013, and it's what is that like? uh, the bow at St James Park in Toronto, which was right. taken down. Um, and it was part of the Occupy movement. It was it was uh, lived in for quite some time, and uh, and the Occupy movement had ended when they took this down. They've built a new gazebo. They've built a new structure now. So, I just thought this was a again, this is a great piece of of Ontario history. We have another question from uh, the audience. Um, she, Susan says, thank you so much, Lindy, for renewing our interest and memories of these family and community events. As I recall, my family used to go on train picnics to Port Burwell or Port Stanley, usually for rail employees. Any trace of those? There are, and unfortunately, there are none in the book. But um, and that's the, there was um, when I was trying to track down pictures. There are some beautiful pictures from Port Stanley and um, Port Burwell. Uh, but the archivist was off on sick leave and I couldn't get access to the pictures. Like I'd, I'd, she'd sent me uh, negatives, but then unfortunately was off on sick leave. So, and then because these archives are staffed often by volunteers and, and by, you know, just uh, local people who spend a couple of hours a week, um, there was no one else to be able to get the pictures to me. So um, if I ever did a broader book, like if I ever did a book about Canada, I would definitely include the areas that weren't included. And I would start with Port Burwell and Port Stanley because the, the photographs were fantastic. And not only that, um, there were a lot of uh, pictures of there were a lot of there were there were pictures of black picnics amongst those. And, and I just I think those are so fundamentally important, as a, you know, as a big part of the settlement of Ontario um, that needs representation. And that actually uh, speaks to the question from Margaret, uh, who says, picnics are very popular with immigrants today and large families gather in public parks and, and are any of these included in your book? Which, of course, yes, they are. And I think picnics yeah. are, are so accessible for everyone um, and a great way to bring families together um, in, in parks. We certainly have lots of families um, picnicking at the, the waterfront here in, in Godridge. It's it's such an uh, it's a beautiful free park that people can gather, and there's lovely shelters and places for for people to gather and bring their families together. Um, I have a uh, it, and it really it just occurred to me when someone asked the question about um, rail employees. Um, where I'm sitting right now is actually a, a converted railway station that's been converted into a. Um, a film studio. Uh, and one of my early memories is in uh, grade one or two. I grew up in the next town down the rail line. And this is when there really still were trains, passenger trains in southwestern Ontario. And in grade one or two, our, our excursion was that we got on the, we walked from the school to the rail station in Clinton, Ontario, Alice Monroe's secondary hometown. Um, and we took the train to here in Godridge, Ontario got out at this very station. I don't remember particularly the station because I don't suppose we even necessarily came into the building. Um, but then we walked across the road, just out there, and um, had a picnic on somebody's front lawn. Uh, and I had forgotten all about that until that rail question came up. And I thought, hang on, I, I remember doing that. And then we walked to the museum, which would have been quite a few blocks for grade one or two, uh, and then took the train home. Uh, I'm so glad I remembered that because that's something that just isn't possible today with, with our no longer having rail, rail uh, travel in much of southwestern Ontario. Did you know the people's lawn that you were having your lunch on or you just picked a, a no, lawn? No, I think the teachers had prearranged it um, right. with someone who had a lovely lawn across the, 
the, the road. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that kind of brought it full circle for me, uh, uh, sitting here thinking about this. Um, Can I go back to just sure. Margaret's comment as well, yeah. um, if you don't mind? Yeah, Matt absolutely. Time? Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Margaret, for asking about, um, you know, uh, picnics and, and immigrant groups. And I, I did, again, on my map of Ontario, where I drew all the places I wanted to go, I also included all the sort of the groups of people, the waves of migration. So, um, and one of the most important pictures for me in the book is a 1909 picture of the signing of Treaty Number no. 9, and um, I find it kind of a, a heartbreaking picture, actually, to be honest. Beautiful, though, profoundly beautiful. It is a group of First Nation women and children gathered at the signing of the treaty. And, and of course, and, you know, we all know what happened with the, with the treaties, but that was definitely included. And later on in the book, um, there's a picture of, uh, and it was actually labeled, uh, I changed the name, naming of the pictures, but the picture was labeled Ch Chinese Picnic. And I, in the archives, and I have changed that to community picnic, but um, the Chinese community had quite an active association very early on, and they held a lot of picnics in, in permanent, they were, you know, predominantly in Toronto, but also, of course, in the far north, where they'd worked on the railway earlier, or their, their, their um, generations of their family had worked on the railway. But I did find... I think one of the most beautiful pictures in the book is a picture of a Chinese father and his children uh, at a community picnic in Toronto. And I find it really touching. So I've written about the history and the, you know, the Chinese Immigration Act and how, um, you know, how it, it banned Chinese people from entering into the country. And after all they've done, it was quite, quite, it's quite staggering. So yes, definitely have included the immigrant groups as much as I was possibly able to. Were there pictures that you really wanted to include that for one reason or another you couldn't that still stick with you? Definitely. I mean, I had to, in the end, we, um, because printing costs had risen so much during the pandemic, we definitely, we cut, we had to cut some pictures from the book. So my first preference was to cut pictures that were, um, the image quality was poor anyway. They might have been there for a reason, but the image quality was really bad. So I knew that they wouldn't reproduce. And that's one of the things when you're working with old photographs is it's not possible to doctor up. And we tried to leave the images alone. We tried not to tamper with the images. Um, in some cases, they were enhanced slightly only to, um, to clear up blurring, but you can't always do that. So I got rid of those pictures first. Um, yeah, the, you know, I mean, there's much more that I would like to have covered, but uh, <laughs> you're, con you're contained by the number of pages that are going to go to the printer. So uh, I just made decisions based on, first of all, rep you know, representing the province, but also on the quality of the images. I want to remind uh, our viewers if they have any more questions to, to uh, just type them out in chat. Um, your favorite picnic spots. Do you have favorite picnic spots around Ontario that you're, you're willing to divulge? Well, you know, um, I really love the locks uh, up the uh, mm -hmm. Rideau Canal. So, and the, they're... <laughs> They're actually quite sparsely used, so I, I find that it's been quite safe during the pandemic, and, and there are a whole series of locks just north of Kingston, um, and those are absolute favorites of mine. But, I, you know, I in the backyard, in the, uh, you know, in, in the local park, and we uh, we were out walking the other night in, in Barryfield, which is a neighborhood in, in Kingston, and there were all kinds, there's a, there's a lovely lawn in the Barryfield Rock Garden, there were all kinds of people picnicking there, and you know, I just wanted to stop and ask if I could take a picture. <laughs> just, but it's, uh, I mean, I think, I think this is the thing to do during the pandemic. And there are, picnics are actually a salvation during the pandemic. For, for certain. And, and during this sort of shoulder period where we can see people outside, but we can't see people inside, I think there are lots of people that are taking advantage of the, the picnic and the gatherings and, and uh, mm -hmm. rediscovering the joy of uh, being outside and... Um, uh, enjoying each other. What about um, picnic disasters? Did you did you get any a sense of uh, the picnic that got rained out or uh, invaded by? Well, we all know that the picnics get they get invaded by seagulls. Um, did you see any uh, photographic um, evidence of those? Not a lot, not a lot. But I did. I mean, there are some kind of funny pictures. So there's a picture taken of a bunch of gentlemen that are arriving at Algonquin Park. Um, 
I forget the date of this picture, but I think it's sort of 1920s, 1930s, perhaps. And uh, there's no picnic table. So they've, they've taken their canoe and turned it upside down and are having the picnic atop the canoe. And so, uh, again, on the running, they're using the running boards at the car. So it must be the, the 20s and 30s. That yes, the, I found it. It's 1932, so actually. And, and I was thinking, what do they do about, you know, bug repellent? Because mm-hmm. they likely wouldn't have had anything other than perhaps citronella. But maybe they just live with the elements more. So... You know, oh, they I can were imagine just, there were a few picnics. Yeah, they were just itchy all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did find that that uh, photo. No, no table, no problem. Uh, 1932. Yeah, um, yeah 1932, I think we, we've yeah. all uh, improvised uh, when we arrive at the picnic spot and realize that we have um, forgot the cutlery. <laughs> yes, uh, don't forget the cutlery or the corkscrew if you're bringing wine. Ex- yeah, exactly. Bring wine Unless it's you know, screw cap. Um, so. Today, I think, you know, uh, sadly, we, we tend to, if we're on a, an excursion with a family, it's so very easy just to pull into the, to the um, fast food and, and grab that bag of, of um, easy food. Um, what would you like to see people revive about picnics in the future? You know, not so much what I want to see people revive about picnics in the future. I, I feel like... Uh, the, for me, the, the thing that I got out of this was get back outdoors, just get mm. back outdoors. Um, and it doesn't have to be complicated, but we spend so much time indoors and so much time on highways. And, it, and I think we, you know, changing that, slowing down and getting outside and spending some hours outside is so restorative and, and it, it kind of changes, resets the brain. So... I, I think, you know, yes, picnic, definitely, but I'll just get outside. Join the friends and family and, and uh, well, have we some. Can, yeah. You know what, because for much of winter, we're not going to be, you know, we don't spend as much time outside, so. Perhaps the winter picnic is the, the thing that we could, um, we could champion. Yes. At I party, do a party Canadians every single year. I, th- I think there is also um, the two kinds of, of picnic, and maybe now it's it's three. So there's the um, picnic where you prepare everything at home, pack it up in the the beautiful basket, or I have some of those lovely tins. I was finding some of my tins in these photos um, with the plaid on the outside. Um, so there's that kind of picnic where you make it all home and you pack it up and you take it and you enjoy it. Then there's the barbecue picnic where uh, you take the food to be prepared. The the camp over the campfire and um, then we have kind of evolved into the fast food picnic of grabbing the bucket of chicken or the the bag of hamburgers um, do you have a favorite of those three do you like cooking outside um, well, I, I I mean if I'm gonna have a picnic with a group I'm a big fan of the potluck picnic and just everybody brings yes. something because it's always so interesting when that happens um, but I'm not I'm not as big a fan of the barbecue picnic um, it's one thing if the barbecues are set up, but transporting all that stuff and the barbecue is just like, oh, it's so much work, right? Yeah. So, I'm, I, you know, I think if I'm going to pack a picnic, I just lean on the side of Simple and, and I really do love the good loaf of bread and the cheese and honey and, uh, you know, fr- fresh fruit. It's, it's the easiest picnic and it ends up being one of the nicest. Terrific. Well, Thank you so much, Lindy, for sharing this book with us. Are there any other uh, stories that you you want to share with us before we close out? No, I, I, don't, I think I think we've sort of covered. But you know, one thing I just like I, I of course I want to say thank you so much to the to the festival and the committee for having me. But I mean, one thing that I just has really I, I really the message that I always want to get out is that I I want people to think about the importance of food and the fundamentality of food. And also, I just want to continue, if, if I can, to pay homage to the women that went before us and did so much work in the kitchen and, and so much work uh, that was, you know, completely, it was unpaid. There was no particular gratitude for it, but it was endless work. And I, uh, you know, I, I feel that I, I never want to stop talking about how fundamental and vital that work was. Yes, the barns that were built and the... Uh, um days that were celebrated uh, because somebody spent many hours baking pies and making salads and uh, baking bread and making sure that it all uh, flowed together and got there safely. And then, of course, someone also has to do the cleanup and wash all those beautiful dishes uh, and transport them safely back and forth between the the picnic site and home. 
Um, yeah. So yeah, there relentless, was a- relentless work. It has been relentless work for, for centuries, for you know, for throughout time. And I, I, I just, I that's my mission in life now is to kind of talk about and honor that work. And done with love. We, you know, we learned about the explorers. We learned about the fur traders. We learned. <laughs> we didn't learn about the women who never stopped working. So. Yeah, it, it fascinates what I, me I it, you know, what they ate. Picnic. Yeah, what did they eat in those mm-hmm. days, and 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 how did they prepare it, and um, what did they they gather in from the from their surroundings? Uh, we could talk about this for a long time, and there's there's obviously lots more to explore. Um, do you have uh, uh, any other new ideas for new books in the pipelines in the future? I do. I'm working on one right at the moment. It's food related. Not maybe as food related as some of the books I've written, but it's definitely food related, and I'll stay in that vein because I I I I just love I love writing about food. Well, we'll we'll look forward to that, and thank you so much for joining us here at the Alice Monroe Festival. Mm-hmm. It's been fascinating. Um, I certainly recommend to anyone that you you can spend a long time just sort of delving into this and getting inspiration for your own picnics in the future. Maybe dusting off some of that china and the uh, silverware um, instead of the uh, Tupperware or the the brown paper bag. Um, I want to thank Lindsay for joining us again today for certain and I'd like to thank some of our sponsors. Uh, I'd like to thank the County of Huron, the Township of North Huron, the Ontario Arts Council, Dr. Marie Gear, Royal Homes, Capital Power, Howick Mutual Insurance, Microwave Basics, and so many more that you will see on the uh, screen in front of you. All of our books are available uh, through the Huron County Library System, but also at the Village Bookshop in Bayfield. So make sure to check them out online and give them a call or, or order through their online uh, and pick up some of these books. Thank you very much for joining us again. Uh, I'd like to uh, hope that we will see you all in person next year in our 20th um, uh, edition of the Alice Monroe Festival of the Short Story. Have a good afternoon, stay safe, and keep on reading.